We need the tonic of wildness, to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk, and hear the booming of the snipe, to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds her nest, and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed, and unfathomed by us because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. When Thoreau penned these words, he was a fish swimming against the current. He was writing in a Victorian world caught in the stream of the Industrial Revolution, modernizing, urbanizing, and colonizing. Today, we see wilderness as something precious. It is a threatened, pristine place where one half expects David Attenborough's voice to come echoing through the trees. To early American pioneers, wilderness was a terrifying adversary, not a thing to be enjoyed. Compared with the pastoral order of the European countryside, the seemingly boundless wilderness of the New World was something else. In the face of this vast blankness, courage failed and imagination multiplied fears. Wilderness was set in opposition to civilization, and became an obstacle to overcome on the road to progress. Lewis Cass, the American Secretary of War, stated in 1830 that, There can be no doubt and such are the views of the elementary writers upon the subject, that the Creator intended the earth should be reclaimed from a state of nature and cultivated. In July of 1845, Thoreau began his seclusion near Walden Pond. That same year, in fact, that very same month, an essay titled Annexation was published in the United States Magazine and Democratic Review. Its author John O'Sullivan was a nationalistic American columnist descended from a colorful line of Irish expatriates and soldiers of fortune. O'Sullivan had an aristocratic manner, and he was a fervent advocate for the prosecution of the Mexican-American War, and later, for the Confederate cause in the Civil War. His name would have been largely forgotten by historians had he not coined one of the most infamous ideas in American history, Manifest Destiny. In annexation, he made the case that it was the manifest destiny of the Anglo-Saxon race to spread across the whole of the American continent, to the possession of the homes conquered from the wilderness by their own labors and dangers, sufferings, and sacrifices. As this rapacious expansion whittled away North America's wild lands, evidence of the continent's great antiquity was already available. A century earlier, in the summer of 1705, a Dutch farmer found a mass of Cyclopean bones eroding from the bank of the Hudson River, near the town of Claverack. In July 1706, more bones were found near Coxsackie, just a day's travel north of the original find. Word spread quickly, and as locals collected the bones, naturalists and educated men began to take notice. A great tooth from Claverack came into the possession of Edward Hyde, the British governor of New York province who shipped it along to the British Royal Society, packed in a box labeled, Tooth of a Giant. He believed it was the Tooth of a Giant that lived before the Great Flood. Less than a decade later, across the Atlantic, in Northern Ireland in the County Cavan, a jaw and teeth were uncovered by mill workers digging a foundation. Several of the teeth came into the possession of the Dublin surgeon Thomas Molyneux, who published an interpretation of the bones in 1715. He based his analysis on comparative anatomy, and quickly became pretty well convinced that they must have been the grinding teeth of an elephant. Such discoveries were novel in the American colonies, but fossil ivory had been exported to Europe from Siberia since at least the time of Peter the Great. While Molyneux dismissed the idea that these were the bones of a giant, he struggled to explain how elephants could have once lived so far north. He wondered at the possibility that this terraqueous globe might in the earliest ages of the world, after the deluge, but before all records of our oldest histories, differ widely from its present geography. It was not until 1796 that French anatomist Georges Cuvier revived the idea. He suggested that these were not simply elephant bones found improbably far north, but represented an extinct species. Evidence was emerging that natural ecosystems could change and that the landscapes which American frontiersmen were settling had once looked very different. By the late 19th century, there was a growing awareness that the American frontier was not boundless or inexhaustible. 
As concerns for the preservation of America's remaining wilderness mounted, Thoreau's romantic exaltation of the natural world began to enter the mainstream, expressed by men like John Burroughs, John Muir, Teddy Roosevelt, and Aldo Leopold. In 1887, Teddy Roosevelt founded the first conservation organization in the United States, the Boone and Crockett Club. A few years later, in the 1890s census, the director of the U.S. Census Bureau announced that the western frontier was closed. For a nation that had identified with O'Sullivan's vision of manifest destiny, this was the end of an era. The historian Frederick Jackson Turner capitalized on the Census Bureau's announcement and published his Frontier Thesis in 1893. According to Turner, the egalitarianism, disdain for high culture, and love of freedom which characterized American life was a result of the constant access to an untouched frontier, with land and resources that never seemed to end. American democracy was born of no theorist's dream. It was not carried in the Susan Constant to Virginia, nor in the Mayflower to Plymouth. It came out of the American forest, and it gained new strength each time it touched a new frontier. If the wilderness was what gave Americans their unique character, then its destruction was a crime. Aldo Leopold lamented that, man always kills the thing he loves, and so we the pioneers have killed our wilderness. Some say we had to, be that as it may, I am glad I shall never be young without wild country to be young in. Of what avail are forty freedoms without a blank spot on the map? To white settlers, the American wilderness was a bottomless, untouched trove of resources, frontiers, and unfinished maps. Of course, this supposed wilderness was already occupied. Nineteenth-century depictions of the indigenous people who found themselves on the wrong side of the colonial encounter painted them as childlike and incapable of advancement. Lewis Cass said of them, They are in a state of nature, as much so as it is possible for any people to be. Influential anthropologists of the day, such as Lewis Henry Morgan and Edward Burnett Tyler, believed that Native Americans could be classified somewhere between savagery and barbarism, with the lowest among them described as little more than animals. Tyler noted that there are several great linguistic families whose members were discovered in a savage state throughout North America. By these accounts, Native Americans were just a feature of the wilderness they inhabited. For men like Roosevelt and Turner, this was implicit in their worldview. This view has long since been banished from academic discourse. Modern archaeological research has proven that Native Americans were adept shapers of their environments. They have transformed ecosystems since they first penetrated the ice sheets at least 15,000 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, humans were cultivating wild plants across the Amazon, altering the balance of ecosystems. Fire regimes in California and the Great Plains were rewritten by foragers, dictating landscape compositions for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. Ecosystems along the Mississippi were shaped by maize farmers, and the Maya cleared forest and altered water tables in ancient Mesoamerica. Since Cuvier's time, we have identified dozens of species of megafauna, which went extinct in the Americas by the end of the last ice age. Many researchers believe that humans contributed to the extinction of some or even all of these megafauna. If this is even partially true, then the ecosystems of North and South America have not been untouched since the first ice age people paddled up the Columbia River or entered the rainforests of South America. If there is a wilderness for us to romanticize and to dream of restoring, it is not the wilderness that European settlers encountered as they conquered North America. It is a much older wilderness, as old as the first Americans, and the end of that wilderness was the extinction of the menagerie of giants that once roamed the continent. <laughs>